David's up in Barry, Barry Green. Yeah. I've looked after Green Room. And the reason I wanted to come up and talk to you, Barry, is that the British cheese industry has moved on quite considerably since, since you started. And, and I have a lot of respect for, and I think a lot of people sometimes forget those that were there right at the beginning of when it started to feel this resurgence, you know. And Patrick Rance, James Aldridge, uh, Dougal Campbell, Humphrey Arrington, uh, and people like yourself. And I think that I think it's really important to talk to people who, you know, you've been making raw milk cheese for, well, you've probably been making raw milk cheese longer than I've been alive. <laughs> you know, so, so, and I think that you were a founder member of the Special Cheese Makers oh, Association, and yeah. you're still a member. How many years has that been going? Well, it started in the late 80s, didn't it? 80s, yeah. Early 90s. So, that's a few years. Yeah. Nearly 30 years. Yeah. Yeah. And I think it's really important to tell your story because you're a, you're a, you're a bit of a hero in the industry, but one that's not talked about enough, in my opinion. So that's what we're going to do. So it's, um, but, but thank you for agreeing to meet to us. Um, so you, how did you end up making cheese? Uh, what, what, yeah. I mean, you, you, how did you end up, yeah. Well, I, I think I've always had an enormous interest in food and I've worked in South Africa with food and food selling and yeah. delicatessens and bakeries. And I found myself here at Lakarte in the mid 1980s, yeah. just visiting. Just I just got married. My wife and I were on a bit of a world tour and taking time out. And we came to Lakarte because my sister and her family lived here. Yeah. We came to visit them. And well, I could spend the next 45 minutes just telling you that story. <laughs> so we went away. We went travelling. Um, we were about to have our first child and we decided where should we settle. And we came to Loch Arthur to say, is there any help needed here? Was this already a Campbell community? This was a Campbell community, it had been so for just under a year. Yeah. It started in 1984, we came in 1985. And there was a small dairy herd, there were three or four cows that were being milked, a couple of Ayrshire's and a couple of Jersey's. Yeah. And everything was being done by hand and everything was very simple. But there was a bit more milk than was required for the consumption in the community. Yeah. Um, everything was raw, everything was simple, everything was very, very basic and yeah. not operated. Um, as it happened, when we decided to stay here, I went and worked in the garden, which I've just shown you around. And it was lovely, it was lovely to be out of my world of food and food processing into this world of gardening and connection with the elements. But as it happened, within six months of me coming here, the person who had started a very simple little creamery mm. in a space not much bigger than this room, yeah. with a little vat taking a hundred litres. Yeah. They'd started a sort of simple farmhouse cheese and some cream cheese and yoghurt. Yeah. And the idea, because we work with people with special needs and because we try and create meaningful work for people, yeah. because we're organic and because we wanted to eat as much of our own food as possible, this cheese making just lent itself well. Mm -hmm. yeah. Our surplus milk went into the creamery, it gave really good jobs to people, yeah. but the person who started it left, mm -hmm. and I was asked would I take this on. And that's actually where the interesting part of the story starts, because I went into the creamery, yeah. put on all my whites, got the uh, grit from my, yeah. my nails, because I'd been gardening, mm -hmm. and actually found this is boring. This yeah. is repetitive, this is scientific, it's precise, I don't need this in my life. And I said to the people in the community, I'll run this creamery for a few months, I'll make sure it's on good footing and then I want to hand it to someone who wants to do this kind of work. Yeah. Well, it didn't take much into the few months for that to really get under my skin. Yeah. And for me to realise that cheese making, although it's in a framework of something that's very precise, very scientific, Mm. very particular in how you must do things. Yeah. Actually, the real thing is the mystique of what goes on around it yeah. and the intrigue. And the kind of control. Yeah. yeah, and it always interests me such a lot that the first thing you put into milk to make it into cheese yeah. is called culture. Yeah. Well, that's what I discovered. It's all about culture. It's all yeah. about the culture of the place. Yeah. And the more I started visiting other cheesemakers, I found Cheese making is a representation of place, of culture, yeah. of what lives in a place. If you do it right, if you, if, you yeah. if it's connected to the, the, the place where it's been made. 
And I just got smitten, and 25 years later I was still making cheese yeah. after a lot of different directions. Yeah. So, because here Lockhart is a, a Campbell community, yeah, um, which provides employment for what, for adults with learning disabilities. Yeah. So there's there's quite a few. How many is in the UK? I and mean, they're all they're all structured differently and run differently, but yeah, there are um, about 60 Campbells across 60 the campbells. UK. But as you say, they're quite different. Quite, quite and you're one of the largest here with. Oh. We're not largest by number of people, but we're largest by land area, yep. and we're one of the largest in terms of our social enterprise. Yep. We've taken an unusual turn in terms of developing big enterprises here, yep. which are a bit out of proportion with the size of our community, <laughs> but have been very special to us. Because if I mean, we work very close with Bottom, which is another one, and if I, as far as I, I'm aware, the, the originally designed to provide a community for learning abilities to work, live, and eat. So the food is designed to be food. Absolutely. The food that you make, the cheese that you make, was originally designed to be consumed by everybody who lives together in these several houses and in community houses and, and, and the kind of like one holistic society, so, so to speak. Totally. Is. And I mean, you've seen, you know, now 30 years later, we've developed quite a big yeah. affair here. Yeah and we've got a massive farm shop and we're employing a lot of people, but everything we've done has been rooted in a sense of purpose. Yep. It belongs to the region, it belongs to our locality, but it also belongs to this community and it feeds this community and it gives the right kind of jobs to the right kind of people. Yep. That's very important. Well, I think you're a key part of this area. I think the reason why people come out this area. So, and, you're still, and you were one of the founding fathers, they, they say, of this, this place. But they, um, and yeah. Is there any others that have left, or are you still...? Most people have stayed. Most we were a group of 12 carrying members yep. on our management group, and in the year 2000, which was a crucial year for us, 2000-2001, because mm. it was a year of foot and mouth. Yep. It was the year we lost our entire dairy herd, along with all yeah. our animals. Yeah. So we were levelled, we had to start from a new you know, mm. starting yeah. line. Um, but we were we realized our determination of how important this work had become for us yeah. so yeah right from the start everything we've done has been about this community and making it work and then so if I go back to when you start you, you sat in that cheese, cheese making room you made cheese and you at the time raw milk cheese making especially soft soft semi soft and soft cheeses because for a time, long time you made a few of my favorite cheeses and you still do make some some of my favourite amazing cheeses. But how did you, because there were so few walnut cheese makers in the UK, there was you, Charles Martel was doing a bit down mm -hmm. in Gloucestershire in those days, mm -hmm. there was Robin Condon, and, and what was linking them all was a few key industry figures like Jane Daldridge and, and Randall Hodgson and a few others that really linked them all. How did you find out about other people making walnut cheese? How did it kind of, you know, because you know, it does it, you didn't have the internet or phone. Yeah, or, you know. thank goodness. Yeah, yeah. Maybe that's why it happened. Yeah. Because before the internet, people were really connected. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not saying we don't connect now, but you're really connected. And for me, when I started here, I knew nothing about cheese making. I sold a lot of cheese yeah. in my former incarnation in South Africa. I ran delicatessens. Yeah. I sold cheese, but I never made cheese. And I just, like I said, got under my skin and I just wanted to know more. Yeah. And my first few visits to a few people, one of the earliest was Humphrey Errington. Yeah. One of the earliest was visiting sites around Dumfries and Galloway where cheese used to be made yeah. and talking to the people who used to make it. Yeah. Or I would go to the Society of Dairy Technology meeting yeah. and I'd think, why am I going to this meeting? But then I'd meet some incredible old timer who'd been making cheese yeah. decades ago yeah. and they'd tell me about the cultures they used and the way they turned the cheese and how they affected acidity. You know, they would really have interesting stories to tell. And what I discovered is that the way to learn to be a good cheesemaker yeah. is to meet other cheesemakers, to, 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 to visit, to talk to people and then come back and understand more about what we were doing. So that was a big part of my world. Mm -hmm. Meeting James Aldridge, meeting Dougal Campbell, meeting Humphrey Errington, talking to um, Randolph Hodgson, you know, mm -hmm. it, it was great. And the other thing that was great about it is that when we came together, there was real friendship. Mm -hmm. And it's very interesting because the last, 
I think the last or the one before of the specialist cheesemakers meetings. Yeah. For a number of reasons I couldn't get to it. Yeah. And just in the last days I suddenly realized, you know, I think I could get down there. Yeah. And my wife was so encouraging, she said, go, because that's your world, that's your yeah. friends, you know. And I was gone a bit of a distance away from it. And I got down there and I felt this incredible warm feeling yeah. of this is a group of people I've really worked together with and we've built up I don't like the word industry, we've built up a culture yeah. of cheese making in this yeah. country that's enviable, it's wonderful. Yeah, and I think it's, it, it's I will not say it's been built from scratch because there was already farm off cheese makers in there, but yeah. the method that we had to relearn to make cheese, there was people making cheddar and Lancashire stuff, but the vast majority of cheeses have gone, you know, and we had to kind of relearn how to build that. And I think that now we look at it, and yeah, I, I did 30 cheeses and I did raw milk and British cheese. And the majority of them from the UK. If I had opened my cheese shop 20 years ago, wouldn't have had much. I, yeah. I wouldn't have heard about Montgomery's on my counter, yeah. and that would have been about it, really. Kirkland's Lancashire, Appleby's Cheshire, that's it. And but then people like you were so key to part of that revival. And I think, um, yeah. So how did you kind of? Yeah, yeah, we were at better stage. Did you now. feel at the time things were changing, or did you just? Oh, there was a groundswell. There was. A, you know, a lot of people were discovering cheese making, but a lot of people in the public were discovering good quality cheeses. Mm. And we were suddenly doing something where we realized we can produce cheeses that are interesting. And what's also interesting for me is the whole question of tradition. Yeah. Because when we started making cheese here, I wanted to discover what's the traditional local cheese. If I want to make cheese in Dumfries and Galloway, yeah. what can I do that's going to be a reflection of what was here? Yeah. Well, yeah. the interesting thing is actually most of the cheese made in Dumfries and Galloway was cheddar, yeah. which yeah. is hardly yeah. traditional yeah. to this area. Yeah. But it was made here, and that's what we started with. And then we started at the hand of making the cheddar, making other products that told our story. Yeah. So it was almost as though we were creating tradition for the future, making Kriffel, making Kabak, making um, Cranogs, making little cheeses that told our story and about what we were about. Yeah. But I also discovered a fascinating thing, is in Dumfries and Galloway, and I've told you this earlier, yeah. there were cheese making on every other farm, the cheese presses were made locally, they were forged in forgeries here, there were um, Forgeries, forgers, mm. yeah. they were real. Um, it, 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 there was a, and the more I explored, I found there was an incredible wealth of cheese making in this area. I now discovered a situation in the mid 1980s where I came along and there was no on no. farm cheese making. There was nothing in Dumfries and Galloway. I think there was one small place where they were making a bit of goat's milk cheese up near Dorai. Mm. And I thought, where's it all gone? And I discovered two behemoths, I mean enormous cheese making factories, one in Lockerbie, yeah. one in Stranra. Yeah. And when I went and discovered that we were, by that stage, very proudly producing or processing 150,000 litres of milk a year. Yeah. And I thought, wow, that's immense, 150,000 litres of milk and we're employing people and we're bringing life to the land and we're bringing rural regeneration, it's yeah. great. And I went and visited one of these factories, which I don't knock, I mean they're doing great work and they're yeah. doing, making an effort to make good cheese and they're quite committed to what they're doing. But the scale, yeah. that's where all the milk had gone because they don't produce 150,000 litres, yeah. they don't produce 1.5 million litres, they produce 1.5 million litres a day. Yeah. Ten years of our production in one day is made in those factories. Yeah. And when I tell people about that, I say, that tells you the story of what the word artisan means, you know, but it's also, on a you know, scale. That is mixing milk from several different farms. I'm all for commercial cheese, but they mix milk from several different farms, so they have to pasteurize. And then they have to standardize, and then they have to kind of add, it's like building blocks, they have to kind of add their own flavor back in to make it consistent, which is nice cheese, which is good cheese, but you, here you have four cows, and it with the cows are on your land, and you can make oh, that that cheese from Dumfrieshire is going to be pasteurised and uh, uh, just a cheese. Yeah. Whereas here, this cheese was look out of this place. Yeah, of this place. Yeah. You know, yeah. you, your raw milk, your four cows, a couple of jerseys, a couple of rations along those lines, and you think that that is it's got that is Isaac, mm -hmm. that is farmhouse, you know, and that and its character of this place. Your cheese still 
We were, yeah, you still cheese still. You, I think you can blindfold me and give you give me certain people's cheeses, and you go, that's from that farm. Yeah. And you, and you know, and, and you just know it's it, it, that sort of. And even if it's different times of the different seasons of the year, it's always got that characteristic of yeah. this place. You know, you you see it go look out of cheddar. Whenever I taste it, it's always got the characteristic of here. Yeah. You know, and you always know kind of that's what cartilage ever, even though it's not always the same. Yes. It has that okay. character, you know, that makes sense. So I'll tell you a lovely story with that actually when we in the I think early nineties, nineteen ninety or nineteen ninety one, we decided to enter a cheese into a show. Yeah. So the first show we went to was our local show, which was the Royal Highland show. Yeah. It was quite prestigious, yeah, yeah. but had a, an appalling record for artisan cheeses. Yeah. There weren't any. Yeah. So it was this big cheese show, yeah. but all it was was blocks of cheddar. Yeah. And in the corner was a little section for artisan uh, cheeses. It's still like that, I've been there. It's, <laughs> it's got a bit a few more, but it's still... It's still and um, um, so we sent our cheese in, I'm very proudly scrape the side, put my tartan banner around mm -hmm. it and made it really presentable as, as this classic farmhouse cheese presentation. Anyway, we discovered the next day that we'd won first prize. It was our first entry into a mm. show. We'd won first prize until I discovered the day after that mm. that there were only two entries in that section. <laughs> <laughs> so I thought, well at least I won first prize and not last prize. I was either first or last, so I came first. We were very proud of that. But the interesting thing for me was that I wanted to know from the judge what did he actually think about cheese because I wanted the feedback, yeah. I wanted to learn, I wanted to grow. And I called him up. He worked for a thing called the Company of Scottish Cheese Makers, or, which became McClellan's, which were the mm -hmm. people in Glasgow who which found is all things, the, isn't it? Probably, yeah. yeah, everything gets bought by someone. <laughs> but um, I phoned up this man and I said, thanks, it's great, we won first prize, but just tell me, what did you actually think of the cheese? And he said, your cheese was well made, I commend it, you're doing a great job, but I do judging generally and grading mm. for supermarkets. Yeah. And I'm working for Marks and Spencer, for Tesco, for Sainsbury's, for all these people. Yeah. And I look for standard consistency. Yeah. And personally, I have to say that I felt your cheese was good, but for my taste, a little bit too close to the cow's tail. Yeah. And I thought, fantastic. <laughs> fantastic. If I'd known about it then, I would have said, this is a branding opportunity. You should have said, Lock Arthur Cheese, close to the cow's tail. <laughs> we were talking about this with a uh, Johnny Cook moment going by, and he was looking at supplying Waitrose, and they said, it would be, if, you, if we took your cheese to Waitrose, it would be our most dangerous cheese. Uh, I said, you've got to put that in the box. We yeah. thought it was the most dangerous <laughs> cheese in our own terms. So, but it, it's, uh, yeah, those words are, those words are. I think that's also a thing of the early days. We were having a lot of fun, you know, people were doing things. And the other thing, and we've spoken about this earlier, yeah. is that we were sharing with each other. We were interested in what each other were doing. Mm -hmm. The meetings, you know, we talk about vegetarian versus animal rennet. We mm -hmm. talk about how long you'd acidify cheese for, when you'd cut the curd. Yeah. You know, these were things that were interesting to us and we loved it. Yeah. And I'm not saying that's not happening now, but it was the basis it was all this interest that's built up in yeah. special yeah, I, We were talking about this earlier on and I think that at this stage, even when I run a little face of cheese making courses, and I say to people that, like nowadays, you can go online and you can buy cultures very easily, you can buy cheese molds very easily, you can even buy cheese presses. And then 20 years ago, some of my cheese makers, they couldn't get anything. They had to you hunt know? it up. Yeah, exactly. So even like we have, a, we have an Irish cheese maker we work with, and he uses bread molds because that's how he set out. He drills holes in all his bread molds, you know, the metal bread, bread tins, and his cheese is shaped like a loaf, you know, and, and that bit, or people drill holes in drain pipes. I was going to say, am I allowed to say on this video, in the early days it was all drain pipes. Yeah, exactly. And, and when I first made, actually, when I first made Kruffel, sorry to interrupt, yeah. but when we started making Kruffel, which became a classic cheese, I wanted to make it in a square mold, Yeah. because I liked the idea that mm -hmm. it would have a distinction. And it was there was a little bit of telegio in my mind, yeah. sort of basing yeah. something on that, the Scottish telegio. And I went along to James Aldridge and I walked around James's place and I said, What are you doing? And show me this and that. Yeah. And I came across these square moulds. Yeah. And I said, Fantastic, these square baskets yeah. draining well, perfect for the job. I said, James, where do you get that? He said, Where do you think I get it? Local garden centre. Yeah. They're, pond, they're pond baskets. <laughs> you know, this is what we did. We made it up, yeah. you know. But yeah, and, and, but that's why I say I think a modern day a, a cheesemaker setting up now, for for some reasons, for a lot of reasons, 
there is much more information, there is much more connection, and there's much more stuff available. You know, there's a school of artists on food, and um, I think it is, but that is because people like yourself set those grounding blocks and set their wheel off in the motion. And I think that, you know, it's important to kind of remember that. And, um, you know, and also because, you know, that you can learn from that still. Whenever a new cheese maker comes to me and they go, I'm just going to set up, I go, whatever you do, don't spend too much money. Yeah. You know, because that's what, it, it's very easy now with everything perfect, you can get a consultant, you can get a perfect cheese mature room, you can get a perfect everything, mm -hmm. but can you make good cheese? Well, I would argue that people like you and James Aldridge make fantastic cheese because you had to be there and look at the cheese and you had to be innovative. You yeah, know, you had to be, creative. well, well I can't afford a, a drying room, how do I dry it? You know, and then, and then all of a sudden you could set up uh, relatively much lower cost and actually I actually think you're more on top of your cheese when you do that because you've really got to look at your cheese if you haven't got a proper drying room because you've got to know when it's drying. You know, you can't just look at the monitor. You yeah. know, so and um simple is good. Yeah simple, simple is simple. good. And that's you know some of the best cheese makers I visited in France and some of the best cheeses in France they don't have anything. Yeah. You know and they, because they just have a cave. But they really know how to make cheese. Yeah. You know and I think that's key. But you you spent a long time making and you still you how many cows are you up to now? About 30. About 30. And they are Ayrshire's or what? There are mainly dairy short ones yeah. now. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of people are moving down that route, aren't they, for cheese making? Well, there are a few reasons for us. One of them is dual purpose because yeah. we do a lot of meat yeah. as well. So when we get bullock carbs, it's important that they're a good quality meat as well. Yeah. And it's more sustainable. And they're sustainable, they're manageable, they're actually a nice breed. And they can go with the weather up here. <laughs> as well as I. <laughs> But the, um, and you're still making more of cheese? We are, we're doing some of our cheeses pasteurised, yeah. pressure. Um, it's, it's hard it's times and there's a lot of pressure and we find that the scrutiny is gruelling and demanding. And not I'm saying I'm proud that we've sort of buckled under pressure, yeah. but particularly in the way we work, I think raw milk cheeses should be made by cheesemakers who are incredibly focused on what they're doing, have a really good understanding of the processes, the yeah. critical control points, the acidity development, yeah. the ripening, the moulds, the surface rind, you yeah. know, all of these things need to be brought into account. And I think in our situation, because we're working with a lot of different people, and we have young volunteers, and we have people coming in and working in the creamery, there was anxiety in our organisation yeah. about the pressures of raw milk cheese making in soft and semi soft cheeses. But your cheddars are still. Our cheddars all unpasteurised, so we're very happy and proud of and, and do you think that makes a difference? Why, why, why have you set out to make raw milk cheese? Why? I mean, the whole community is based around that, but what do you think makes a difference? I had an interesting experience. When we were. Um, the only time we've pasteurised initially in our early years mm. was during foot and mouth. Yeah. So that was a, a ruling. You couldn't use milk locally because this was a foot and mouth certified region. Yeah. You couldn't put milk through a process unless it had been pasteurized. Yeah. So you saw outside the creamery there's a pasteurizer standing. Yeah. We've only used it for about one year in our entire yeah. existence. Um, and that was to, to process during foot and mouth. I found an interesting thing. The farmhouse cheddar type cheese, mm. I really noticed the difference and the difference was that there was a consistency that made it slightly boring. Yeah. They were so predictable yeah. because you'd wiped out all the natural flora mm -hmm. and you were working from a baseline that was, we were doing almost what the man who judged my cheese said, yeah. I want consistency and I want predictability. Yeah. And I found the cheese was good. Yeah but just had an edge of something that was a bit boring. Yeah. The interesting thing was when we made Criffel cheese, a lot of the development of the cheese comes post-pasteurization. Mm -hmm. So when we were pasteurizing those, we still had all our cultures and all the interest mm -hmm. in the ripening room. Yeah. So it's almost like you pasteurize the milk, but you then brought in other aspects of flora that gave intrigue and interest, and I thought we were still making good quality criffles. Yeah. And I know certain people... Because the ripening room was still full of the bacteria. The ripening room was full of the bacteria. Yeah. So it's like we brought the edge in after the make, yeah. you know, which was fine. Yeah. Um, raw milk cheese, I believe, why pasteurize? Yeah. If you 
because this notion that pasteurization is the clean-up and the save all yeah. of any problems for anyone getting ill from cheese, I think is misguided. I think what well, I think what it does is take your focus away from proper dairy management and proper parlour management and, and, and allow and, and and actually when we look at better ways of making raw milk, they look at animals like dairy short ones, less likely to get mastitis, yeah. better quality milk. So yeah. you have to kind of whereas if, you know so it, it is whereas you focus and I always think I always say two things, but you pasteurise, it takes your focus away from your cleanliness of your parlour and your animal feed and, and, and your and your housing. And also it gives people a false safety net. Absolutely. Because I always say that look, we have a fabulous cheese tumble, that's absolutely amazing. It's pasteurised. But by the time it gets to me, it was eight weeks ago when it was pasteurised. And it just needs it's a perfect medium for anything to go in. Absolutely. It just needs one bit of malpractice from absolutely. a delivery driver or or a, a poor cheese monger, or somebody drops it on the floor, or a poor restaurant, mm. and it's just the perfect medium for everything going. But every, everything's fine, it's pasteurised. Whereas actually, a safe cheese like cheddar is the is the opposite. You know, it's kind of such a dry, stable cheese. Totally. It, it's a look for me. It's a, yeah, but so it's a and and what? So you think that if you pasteurise a cheese, everyone just Right. You've taken a box. You've ticked a box. Yeah. You know, whereas so actually then the. Yeah, everything else falls by the wayside. Yeah, everything else falls by the wayside, and I think you, you don't. Um, and I like that they were in the front when I was there, it might change now. But when you'd be visited by the food health authorities, the agents sanitaire, they call them in France, they it's a nice name in the NHL. But they, um, they took into account the whole farm. Mm -hmm. So they wouldn't, whereas in Britain, they kind of separate cheese making in the farm. Whereas the agent sanitary would go, right, show me your procedures, show me clean up season and that. Show, and then to, for your cheese, mm -hmm. you know, whereas in Britain they tend to separate it out. And that means in France they could look at the whole picture of the farm rather than going, how is your cheese safe? And they're happy now. And so, so that, uh, you know, that means that they can make some high risk cheeses and make them safely, I think, because they're concentrating on the animals and doing the animal practices. We have a very interesting, as you know, we're quite involved in retail of cheese yeah. as well as making of cheese. We've now moved a lot into retail. Is a big part of what we do and we sell a lot of fantastic cheeses yeah. and very happily. I had such an interesting experience with the Environmental Health Department yeah. a year or two ago where they came in and said look I know you're not going to like this but I'm afraid you've got to do, I think I talked to you about it, you've yeah. got to do total segregation of pasteurised and unpasteurised cheeses. Yeah. And I just looked at her and I said why? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And she said to avoid cross-contamination. So I said but the, the, the word you're using, the expression contamination, yeah. implies that certain of these cheeses are contaminated yeah. and certain aren't. Yeah. And that's making a judgment. If that cheese has been made well as an unpasteurized cheese and gone through all the hoops and achieved the yeah, right facility yeah, yeah. and yeah. the due diligence has been applied, it's not a contaminated product, it's a safe product. Yeah. It's as safe as its pasteurized partner next door. And as you yeah. say, which might have picked up any range of pathogens post pasteurization. And, 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 and I think, like you said, it's, it's so much about good practice, good practice. about understanding yeah, yeah. what you're dealing with. And the, um, and the pathogens are mainly environmental contaminants anyway, so they're coming in from elsewhere anyway. Yeah. And, and also, unpasteurized cheese, my own, it has to comply to the same legislation in terms of testing, final product testing, as the, the creamy and strand map. Totally. So, what is, you know, anyway, yeah. we could go and talk about that for a long time. <laughs> But it's, so, so that's, and so, how do you feel about, you know, there has been this, since you started this ball rolling, you, you and a few others, key members of the, the industry, the industry has changed quite a bit in those years, and then do you, kind of, what are the changes that you've seen, really? What, I mean, how do you feel that the industry is evolving? You know, cheese making such a balance between art and science. Yeah. And I think that's very important to understand. Yeah. You need, I don't consider myself a scientist. Yeah. I don't particularly consider myself an artist. Yeah. I consider myself passionate and I love what I do. I've tried to understand well the science of cheese making to a level that's good enough for me to do what I need to do and do it with consciousness and do it well. Yeah. I've tried to steep and immerse myself in the art and culture of cheese making yeah. to an extent that's good enough for me to do it well. I think my impression has been that over the past few years, even within the Specialist Cheesemakers Committee, which I'm a member of and which I'm passionate about, yeah. there's been quite a move towards dealing with the technical aspects, dealing with the scientific aspects. Yeah. Because we have to, because we have to show the authorities 
that we know the science, that yeah. we understand what we're doing, that we have a code of practice that is better than anything they could produce. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. That we are run, we're we running. We can self-regulate better than we can self-regulate. Yeah, yeah. What worries me is if I came into cheese making today, I would find a very different environment to what I found years ago. Yeah. And years ago, we weren't poisoning people. People weren't dropping dead on the street side from cheese making. It was a safe environment, we were doing well. Small scale, and you were, I always think that as a farmer street maker, you, you have that uh, ability to be really connected to your animals and your products. And, and the last mean, thing you want to do is make someone sick. No, exactly. You're you're proud, you're proud of what you do. I, I, I once went to a talk by a French from a French cheese maker, and he said that still, that in France they have the same problem. You know, we think France is this panacea, but actually, France has the same problem. He says, still, they look at farmer street makers in France, and they, they think they're amateurs. They think they're just playing with it. Because it's actually, we're professionals. My business, and my business yeah. is a professional business, sure. and I'm trying to make the best quality cheese in the world, okay. and trying to sell my cheese effectively and keep keep employment in my area. And actually, I'm trying to be at the top level. Just because I'm not a big business and got hundreds of thousands of liters of milk, doesn't mean that I shouldn't be viewed as an amateur. Yeah. You know, and I think that's a fundamental thing. A fundamental problem in our British psyche sometimes that artisan is sometimes viewed as amateur, which is it's not. Yeah. You know, it's, uh, it's, and my worry in this day and age is that the expectation on a small scale cheese maker is yeah. so high in terms of their testing regimes, their knowledge, their understanding of how bacteria work and what happens and, yeah. and how you can bring this pathogen in and how you deal with that and how you deal with the other and the critical control points and you know it's, yeah. it's a lot for people to take in, it's the stuff of sleepless nights you know yeah. and it's a pity because actually people then potentially are taking their eye off the ball mm. on the day-to-day -day work which is where you, like you say, you really need to be focused, you really need to understand the nature of the product you're working with more than understand the very intricate science of it. And we, we had a discussion with a, a new cheese maker actually very recently and um, it was really interesting because he said that if I hadn't have come to visit us first he would have ended up making jelly. Uh -huh. Because he came to visit us and we said look like Here's, you've got to find out what cheese you're going to make, what, what you like, what you enjoy, what is, you know, and what cheese you're going to be confident making and happy making and fixing with your routine of your day. Yeah. And that is the cheese you should make because then you'll be, you'll love it. And then if you love it, you'll take care of it, you'll take care of the whole process. Yeah. And then, and then he went away and said, well, I, and then, he, then he contacted various departments and various people here and there. And they were like, well, if you're going to make a raw milk, you need to have loads of starter in there, you need to acidify it fast, you need to make it, you know, you need to hit those critical control points. And then he came back to us and we said, well, no, actually you don't. This is where you need to look for this body of evidence. This is how you need to kind of, who you speak to, so you can argue your point and you can make this cheese that you want to make. But his argument, and he's been about this one for a couple of years, and he's making cheese now. And his argument was that if he'd gone straight to somebody other than us, he would have been called, not strong-armed, but just by having to hit those scientific targets, he would have ended up making a cheddar. Mm -hmm. You know, and he said, by actually coming to you, he said, no, well, you can bend that rule here, you can apply that here, and you can apply that knowledge there. He said, I didn't have that knowledge. You know, and, and I didn't have that knowledge. I would have gone to, 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 to the government and said, what cheese can I make with warm milk? And they would have ended up making a cheddar because it's very safe. You know, yeah. so... It's interesting it's, as well. One of the defining characteristics of artisan cheese, in, yeah. in, in my opinion, is that you get it belongs to the culture of the cheesemaker. I've mentioned this yeah. earlier. And when I started cheesemaking, there were certain people who told me there are certain things you can't do. Yeah. There are certain rules. So for example, when we were making a cheddar, there's this process which you'll understand in cheddar making, where you finish your scald, yeah. stirring the curd, yeah. Then you leave it to do what's called pitching. Yeah. So that's where all the curd settles to the bottom of the vat. Yeah. And you check for acidity. Yeah. Once you reach the right acidity, you drain the whey off yeah. and you go on with the cheddaring process. Now I was told, and I read some amazing books from the early years of, of, yeah. of cheese making, manuals there. That was the other thing. The Ministry of Agriculture used yeah, to publish incredible manuals on cheese them, making. Yeah. And they were so interesting. They were so much about the actual art of cheese making, not just about the science, yeah. they're about how you make it. Mm -hmm. But I was told you have to pitch for 15 to 20 minutes, then get the way off, then carry on. Yeah. And I said, 
we can't pitch for 15 to 20 minutes because it's 12.15 at that time. Mm. And one of the things in a Camp Hill community that's very precious to us is we stop for lunch. Yeah. We all go home to our houses, we sit together and we eat an incredible meal and yeah. we enjoy each other's yeah. company, yeah. what we were talking about earlier, yeah, that exactly. people still do in France and yeah. Spain and so on. And I said, if we're going to make a cheese like that, I don't want to make cheese because it's going to completely throw the rhythm of our day. Mm. So I'm going to pitch for an hour. Yeah. And someone said to me, you can't, you can't pitch for an hour, it can't be done. Yeah. We have always pitched for an hour, <laughs> and you've just been in our career, and I saw you looking up from 1999 to 2018, we've run one awards for our cheese almost every year, yeah. and we pitch for an hour. Yeah. So yeah. it just goes to show, you know, it's it's responding, it's adapting, that's what artisans about, and it's not having the, the rules. The cheddar that you started off in that cheddar recipe, but it becomes of your place. You know, exactly. Uh, because, yeah. of, because it fits in with the routine of your day. And that's what it would have happened when a lady down the road was making cheese on yeah. her own farm. She yeah. wouldn't have been going, got to do this, got to do that, got to do that. She'd gone, yeah, well, I've got to get the kids from work. I've got, exactly. to, you know, I've got to go and feed the hens now. I'm just going to have to pick that. You know, and that's how we would have got different cheeses. Yeah. You know, and that's, you know, and that, that, that's, yeah. So we've got to remain open to those sort of influences. Yes. Because they're the reality of artisan production. No, exactly. And so from those initial four cows, you now. The business has changed a lot, Larry. You know, oh, it's changed uh, enormously. I mean, cheese making grew enormously. So yeah. we moved in a space of oh, between five and ten years. I can't remember the exact scale of it. From four cows to thirty cows, yeah. one hundred and fifty thousand liters of milk, fifteen tons of cheese, approximately, distributing all around Britain. It was very exciting for us. One of the most important things. It was exciting. We were getting good income from it. Yeah. It was making a lot of sense of the sort of add-on value for our farm. But the most important thing is we created a really, really good workplace for people. Yeah. And we found that people could become skilled in jobs. Yeah. So there's a man with Down syndrome who's lived and worked here for 30 years. Actually, he's been here longer than me. Yeah. And he is an expert at stirring the vat. He's an expert at certain aspects of cleaning and washing. Yeah. People don't realize how skilled you've got to be to hand stir a vat yeah. and make sure curd doesn't get stuck in the corners. It's mainly done by automatic paddles now. Yeah. Find someone who has the patience. You met a man earlier at our creamery called Peter. Peter discovered that he had this real knack of just slowly and quietly walking around the cheese store, wiping and turning cheeses. Yeah. And he loved it. He loved it to work alone. Yeah. He loved it to work quietly and to be very mindful about what he did. Yeah. In today's terminology, they say win-win. You know, yeah. we got great cheese wiping. Yeah. Peter got a great sense of in, of involvement in life. Yeah. So the, the 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 thing evolved, but at the same time, we evolved other parts of what we're doing: baking, mm. uh, meat production, yeah. fruit and vegetable production, yeah. and then the development of our farm shop. So yeah, things have changed. And how many how many how many people do you employ now? We're employing over 40 people. What, it's going to need from six, 30 years ago? From six. Well, no, from six, six years ago. Six, six years no, ago. Let me say that. Oh, yeah. yeah. When, when we put in an application to build our new farm shop for grant funding, yeah. we anticipated we'd create five new jobs <laughs> in the next three years. Yeah. We created 15 in the first three months. Yeah. Because we've gone into an area where people, and that's what's so wonderful in Britain at the moment, is people are waking up. People yeah. are responding. People are wanting this quality of food. You know, we're, we're Kathy and I are walking around our farm shop, and I knew before I came. I said to Kathy, "I'm going to take some money because I'm just going to spend so <laughs> much money." But you want, to, you want, you come into your farm shop, and it's unlike a lot of farm shops actually because the fruit and veg, a lot of that you grow yourself. Mm -hmm. The meat is from your own uh, yeah. organic farm. The cheese is from your own organic farm. Mm -hmm. You know, you do all the weaving. You know, of, of all, the, and you've got your your sheep pelts, and you think. You just I want, yeah, and not only that, I always say that we work at Bottom Village, and I always say that, that if, you, if you don't like their cheese, you're going to hell. Because it's made on the farm, it's oh, organic, right. it's dairy short on. That's a strong it's, statement. Well, exactly, yeah, <laughs> but, but, yeah. But it's raw milk, it's made by adults with learning disabilities. Yeah. You just, you, and, it, and it's mighty tasty. Yeah. You know, and you just want to buy that product, yeah. in my opinion. You know, it's, it feels like it feels right, you know, so it's, and it's the same with your farm shop when you come in. I will I I feel good about spending money with you. You know, so it's, it's um, fun, yeah, I'm your husband. So it's, uh, it's, it's very difficult. <laughs> yeah, you don't get in the wallet, yeah. <laughs> but um, 
no, I think that. No, well, another thing. Push up, though, so yeah. What, yeah. Yeah. What you've created is fabulous, and and. Well, it's created around what it tells a story of what we're about, and that's, that's very important. Yeah, and I think that yes, people pay, pay a premium to come to places like yourselves and ours, but that is what you provide. You provide such an amazing and, and jobs in a community, a rural community, yeah. which is probably thing. Le yeah. little industry left. Yeah. You know, it's not even that much tourism in Dumfries and Galway because it's it's the through road, isn't it, to the, to the islands? Picking up, it's picking up, but it's, but it's, it's not the islands. islands. No, exactly. So I think that you create this little area, and the economic contribution to your area mm. is massive. Mm. You know, and I think that you should be proud of that. But not only that, your contribution to British cheese in general is massive. And well, another that thing that was big, which you haven't mentioned, so I'll mention it, yeah. was our winning in 2011 of the uh, Best Food Producer in the yeah. Food and Farming Awards. And you know, it's interesting because it's an accolade yeah. and it fills one with a lot of pride. I mean, to say, gosh, we've achieved this. Yeah. Something I told you about earlier was it wasn't just what we did, yeah. it was our customers. It was people in Dumfries and Galloway who said, we've won, you yeah. know, because this is a community yeah. venture and people are really part of it. But it, it really sort of catapulted us into a new dimension. But the most important thing for it was actually what we experienced with the judges when they came here, because they felt exactly what you felt. Yeah. They felt there is something very special happening in this place. Yeah. And the nicest thing they said in their sort of write-up of us when we, when we won that award was, please understand this is not a sympathy vote. This is not saying, <laughs> well, the people with learning disabilities, no. so we give them the vote. They said this was judged totally on the quality of the products. This yeah. is this is nice world class story. production, yeah. and by the way, it's done in a social enterprise, yeah. and it's and it's produced by people who have special needs. And what a fantastic yeah, thing! That, and and that's what we very much base ourselves on. Is not saying we'll dumb things down, we'll use the lowest common denominator. No, we'll strive for excellence. We'll strive to do something really, really good. And it shows. You know, I wouldn't have your cheese in my shop. Or even Bob Village's cheese in my shop if they did not stand up on taste. Yeah. Because at the end of the day, we've tasted out every cheese in my shop must be amazing. Yeah. And as much as I love the story of, of the whole place and the ethos, and that ticks so many boxes for me, yeah. it has to taste amazing too. Yeah. And I think they go hand in hand. The way that you farm, the way that you farm your animals, the way that the way that you you milk may help to make an amazing product, doesn't it? So it all kind of clicks in together. But you know. It, yeah. And it gives people and the people who live and work here an incredible sense of purpose to mm. say and dignity and yeah. well-being about their sense of themselves to say, I am part of a sort of world-class outfit. We do yeah. really, yeah. really good stuff, you know. Yeah. Very yeah. important to no. us. No. Well, thank you very much for your time, Barry. Right? And it's for making been a great pleasure to today. Have and um, please come down and see us. But if not, then uh, I, I, I we'll be back anyway. I value your contribution to British cheese. Thank you. It is not unnoticed. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Mary. <laughs> Cheers, Kathy. <laughs>